Perfect. All right, Professor Brody, please go ahead with your uh, introductory remarks for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for inviting me to testify uh, today and also for accommodating my schedule. Uh, let me get directly to the issues that I think will be of most help to this committee. Um, on the issue of prorogation, I think the authority to request the prorogation is clear for centuries. Parliament has met at the call of the sovereign. And since the development of the uh, principles of responsible government in the 1800s, the decision to prorogue has been made solely by the Prime Minister. The Governor General prorogues, but does so solely on the advice of the Prime Minister. So questions regarding prorogation are rightly answered by the Prime Minister as the decision maker. The purpose of prorogation uh, until 2008 was considered a routine matter. Prime Ministers typically prorogue Parliament every year or two. Uh, prorogation obviously clears the Parliament's legislative agenda and gives the government an opportunity to present a throne speech. There's no constitutional need for prorogation, however. Of course, during the 42nd Parliament, Mr. Trudeau's government refreshed its agenda several times without proroguing over the four years. Nor is prorogation required for the House to be able to demonstrate its confidence in the government of the day. The House holds regular votes on matters of confidence. Members of this committee certainly know the business of supply and the business of ways and means ensure confidence votes are scheduled every few weeks when the House of Commons is sitting. Prorogation instead is a strictly political act done strictly for political reasons. On the essential elements of prorogation, while a Prime Minister may prorogue Parliament and then recall it days or even months later, leaving a gap between prorogation and the recall of Parliament is not advisable. Once Parliament is prorogued, if there's a sudden need for urgent legislation, then the formalities around a new session of Parliament delay the consideration of that urgent legislation. It's better, if possible, to prorogue the day before the recall of Parliament, and Prime Ministers often do this by giving advance notice of their intention to prorogue. I believe the committee has heard about the <coughs> uh, prorogation of December 4, 2008. As mentioned, prorogation was a routine matter until that prorogation. The, the prorogation of December 2008 was turned into a matter of partisan division, and that division gave rise to the reform of Standing Order 32-7 in the 42nd Parliament. The report that's been laid before this committee perpetuates, I think, uh, an effort to politicize that prorogation when it falsely claims the government of the day prorogued to avoid a confidence vote that could potentially have caused its fall. 12 years have passed since the events of 2008, enough time to allow for a more sober, nonpartisan evaluation of those events. I've offered such a, uh, an account in my book, At the Center of Government, and I'm going to draw on my remarks in that book uh, for my remarks today. Committee members will recall the federal election of 2008 delivered a disappointing result for all three opposition parties. The Liberals under Mr. Dion lost 18 of their seats in the House. The NDP failed to reach the 20% of the popular vote that they had long sought. And the bloc in that election was unable to eliminate the beachhead that the Conservatives had established in Quebec in the previous general election. Mr. Dion announced he would resign as Liberal leader, and the other two opposition leaders faced tough internal questions about their future. The November 30th Pact of 2008, announced by Mr. Dion and the other two leaders, was depicted as a reaction to the government's economic update and its proposal to phase out the per-vote subsidy for political parties. But it was later reported in the media that the pact had been under discussion weeks before that economic update was delivered. In retrospect, I think it's now clear that the November 30th pact was a way for weakened party leaders, particularly Mr. Dion, to protect and extend their own leadership positions against internal party challenges. This view was validated by subsequent events. After the prorogation, the Liberal caucus forced Mr. Dion's immediate resignation. When the House returned a few weeks later, the Liberals, then led by Mr. Ignacio, voted to keep Mr. Harper, Mr. Harper's government in office when it presented its budget. The crisis of 2008 then was the breakdown of good governance inside the Liberal caucus. The controversy about the 2008 prorogation was an effort to distract attention from that crisis. Let me compare this to the prorogation that's under study by your committee, the prorogation of August 2020. <clears throat> your study of last August prorogation is extremely helpful. You are setting a precedent for how reports on future prorogations will be handled, and you're doing so with help from experts. I hope the Prime Minister will set a useful precedent and appear before you to answer questions about his decision as it was his decision. Let me suggest some questions that committee members could helpfully pose to the Prime Minister. First of all, 
The August 2020 prorogation came after five months of special orders that had already greatly curtailed all parliamentary proceedings. Parliament had really not had a suitable amount of time for scrutiny, debate, or legislation between two th uh, March of 2020 and the prorogation. Was the Prime Minister worried that in proroguing he would further curtail the legitimate work of this House of Commons and the representatives elected here? Secondly, he prorogued Parliament immediately and then recalled it weeks later. If the government had required urgent legislation to re respond to the ongoing public health crisis, which it has done several times since March, if those, that urgent legislation would have been delayed. In proroguing, what plans did the Prime Minister have for mitigating the risk of the need for urgent legislation? Thirdly, the government was already behind schedule in responding to the Truchon decision. Prorogation inevitably put pressure on the House of Commons and the Senate to cut short their debates on the weighty issues in Bill C-7. Prorogation showed, I would say, in effect, if not in intent, a disregard for the legitimate parliamentary debate of medical assistance and dying bill, and that verges on the contempt for parliament. What does the parliament, what, do, what would the prime minister say, but the idea that he showed disregard for legitimate debate on Bill C-7 by proroguing it all? Fourthly, of course, the Prime Minister's decision to prorogue ended ongoing committee investigations of what appears to have been a major conflict of interest on the part of the Prime Minister himself, and possibly the then Finance Minister. What steps is the Prime Minister prepared to take to dispel the cloud over this aspect of his decision? My conclusion, members, the so-called proroga prorogation crisis of December 2008 was in fact triggered by a crisis within the Liberal Party caucus. Proroguing the House back then gave the Liberal Party time to resolve its internal governance problems. The Harper government, evidence of the fact that the Liberal Party, after resolving its internal problems, sustained the Harper government in office at the beginning of 2000. I would say the August 2020 prorogation took place in a similar situation. A breakdown of governance within the Liberal Party was triggered when Mr. Trudeau, the then Finance Minister, put themselves in what appears to have been a direct conflict of interest. I'm sure I'm happy to take questions if members have them. Thank, thank you, Professor Brody. So seeing as how we have about 10 minutes, I'll give each party two and a half minutes to ask questions to Professor Brody. We'll start with uh, the Conservative Party. And if you could just put your hand up, because I don't know if you want to go in the regular order. Um, Mr. Lukiski was up a regu in the regular order. Yes. Now, Madam Chair, are okay. you saying we only have two and a half minutes? Uh, for this uh, witness, so your questions are only going to be to Mr. Brody, and then afterwards we'll hear from the other two witnesses and go into our regular um, regular round. Right. Thank you very much, and I uh, welcome Mr. Brody back to this committee. It's good to see you again. Uh, in uh, in order to give full transparency, I should also say that I know Mr. Brody well. I've known him for many years since he was formerly a chief of staff to then Prime Minister Harper. Now, colleagues, listen, we are charged with the responsibility of conducting a study onto the reasons why this government and this prime minister probed parliament. Well, quite frankly, the reasons are crystal clear and we all know it. The prime minister probed parliament in August of last year for one simple reason, to shut down the committees that were investigating the We Charity scandal. And it was successful. It was quite successful. And as one of our former uh, witnesses, Professor Kathy Block said it was a good strategy. But the reality is that that was the singular reason for the Prime Minister to probe Parliament. It wasn't to hit the reset button. The Liberals will argue that prorogation was necessary because of the pandemic and the rapidly changing world order due to the pandemic. The government had to come up with a new throne speech and a new plan and a new agenda. Uh, I suggest that that is absolutely wrong. That argument is weak because there was another option to prorogation. It's called a budget. The government could have tabled a budget, or at the very least, a very detailed and in-depth and thorough financial and fiscal update, followed very closely by a budget. They did not need to prorogue. It was done for political reasons only, to curtail the pol political damage that was being done to the prime minister and his government. We know this, every Canadian who has a passing interest in this issue knows it, and my friends on this committee from the Liberal ranks know it as well. Now, Professor Brody, since we have limited time, I'll go directly to a question to you. You reference in your opening remarks that you concur with my observation that this prorogation was done for what you consider to be political reasons, but it did not have to be so. 
the Prime Minister could have prorogued literally a day before he recalled Parliament. Can you expand on those thoughts a little bit and offer your opinions as to why the Prime Minister might have prorogued a good month prior to the recall of Parliament? And was it necessary to prorogue at that time? Briefly, please, because well, there's not a lot of time left. You have 10, understood. 20 seconds. Mr. Lukuski, pleasure to see you again. Uh, look, uh, all I can say is that prorogation is always a political decision since it's always the decision of the prime ministers. Uh, this, the argument that there was a need to relaunch or uh, cl uh, clean out and restart the government's agenda, I think is, is proven by the events of the 42nd parliament uh, when there was no uh, prorogation. So that leaves, I think, procedural issues related to committee investigation was the real reason for that prorogation. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got uh, from the Liberals. Do Mr. Turnbull, would you like to take the two and a half minutes? Or, okay, go sure. ahead. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Brody, thanks for being here today. We appreciate your uh, your opening remarks. Um, just just wanted to ask you, what do you think is a, a real legitimate reason for a prime minister to prorogue Parliament? Well, look, as I said, uh, prorogation is always a political decision, and I guess uh, as a result of my background uh, as a political scientist, I think political reasons for political decisions are perfectly legitimate. So the Prime Minister might want to have uh, uh, a pro prorogation for any one of many reasons. Uh, nonetheless, the ending of a committee investigation, is, if that the, was the purpose of the prorogation, I think what, what about uh, What about a, um, a major shift in or an economic crisis? or a downturn in the economy, like a recession. Um, like Prime Minister Harper, you were the chief of staff for Prime Minister Harper, I understand. Um, in 2009, when Stephen Harper prorogued Parliament, uh, what was the reason for that that was given? Uh, I'm afraid, uh, Mr. Turnbull, I, I stepped down as chief of staff uh, at the end of uh, June of 2008, so I can't speak to the uh, internal reasons for that. All I can do is speak to the report that's before the, the, the committee. Here well, and what well thank you for that. That's fine. I understand. So Dimitri Sodas was uh, was um, quoted in the Toronto Star saying, it's the time to engage with constituents, stakeholders, and businesses in order to listen to Canadians, identify priorities, and to set the next stage of our agenda. So I would, I would say, isn't there a plausible explanation here that in a global pandemic that the Prime Minister simply prorogued Parliament for the very good reason that it's had deep economic social impacts across our society and across, in fact, across the globe, and it was time to recalibrate and reset the agenda? Wouldn't that make sense? All I can say, Mr. Turnbull, is during the 42nd Parliament, this, this uh, uh, government did not prorogue and relaunched its agenda, so it managed all of those consultations without prorogation. So I think we need to look a little bit more carefully at the, co the political context of what was going on in the House of Commons at the time of the prorogation to understand the thinking. Um, These are questions best answered by the Prime Minister. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's Justin, the clerk of the committee. Um, Madam Chair, um, it appears that the uh, sound quality for um, Dr. Brody isn't sufficient okay. for the interpreters to continue. Um, Dr. Brody, can we ask you to try to lift your um, your microphone a little bit closer sure, to your yes. mouth? And that might yes. uh, that might help. Do you, do you have a headset with a, a boom mic? You said no, you I have don't. from the university. Okay, no. all right. Uh, so just, I guess, do as the, as the clerk yes. requested. Then Great. Uh, we have uh, about uh, twenty more seconds. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just, you know, my concern here is pretty simple. I think it's intuitive for any Canadians out there that when Prime Minister Harper chose to prorogue Parliament uh, four times in a matter of about six years, including 181 days of time that Parliament couldn't sit, uh, I don't think, I mean, certainly the opposition parties at the time, namely the Liberals, uh, put in place a mandatory requirement, a change to the standing orders, which which asked, um, you know, for an explanation to be tabled, a, a report, which, uh, you know, I think our government has done. So to me, when I look at that report, uh, it seems like it builds a very good, strong case and rationale for why Parliament uh, would have been prorogued. So I, I think the speculation that you've made or as, to, as to why the Prime Minister made that decision just doesn't seem to be uh, justified, at least as far as I can tell, based on the documentation that we have. Okay, uh, that's all the time we have. Monsieur Therrien, for two and a half minutes, please. Merci, merci beaucoup d'être là pour nous. 
Euh, J'aurais une question simple. Euh, écoutez, si je vous comprends, la prorogation a été faite tout simplement pour étouffer l'affaire de WeCharity, c'est ça? We don't have translation yes, coming through, um, so I'll restart the time for that. Uh, Professor Brody, I hope you'll, you're able to stay over by just a couple of minutes because there's a few technical sure. difficulties. Um, sorry, Madam Chair, it's Justin the Clerk again. Monsieur Terrien, est-ce que vous pouvez monter votre micro un petit peu plus vers votre bouche? Oui, oui, okay. je m'excuse. Merci. Est-ce que ça va, là? Oui, allez -y. OK. Alors, je vais répéter ma question. Let me repeat my question. It's very simple. Has prorogation helped to stop the investigation on weed charity? Yes. Okay. Écoutez, moi, je sais pas trop quoi d'autre ajouter. I wouldn't know what to add to this answer. It is obvious for everybody, except for our, our friends across. Uh, um, And so they said that they wanted to restart the situation. And when they prorogued Parliament, we thought that there would be a change in their policies or, or their outlook, political outlook. Did you feel that there was a change in vision or in the main policies? Or was it was it trying to st start afresh? Uh, I didn't feel that that was the case. And, uh, and everything was... Business as usual. Did you see any difference, Professor? Well, I, I'm not here to testify in a partisan capacity, so I'm going to be careful about passing judgment on the government's broader uh, uh, political agenda. But no, I think we're in the same uh, uh, dominating political issue of the day is the is the ongoing public health crisis, and that hasn't changed since last March. Okay, AP. Uh... And was it a mistake to shut down Parliament for six weeks? You said that uh, prorogation should be short, but we're in a pandemic. This is irresponsible. And I would say uh, I agree with your assessment. Uh, uh, given the number of times that the government has needed earth legislation to respond to the public health crisis since March 17th, it was running an extraordinary risk to leave the House of Commons shuttered for as many weeks as it was. Because to recall Parliament earlier would then have required, obviously, a throne speech and all of the uh, procedural issues around the recall of Parliament, delaying uh, urgent legislation if some had been needed. And I think at the time that the prorogation was uh, 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 was executed, it was unclear whether the government might need uh, additional emergency legislation during that period. There was a risk in proroguing Parliament and then calling it back some weeks later at that point. But you're also talking about the downturn that came from C7, where the damage is caused because everything was slowed down, the debate on C7. Could you come back to that, please? The issue of the medical assistance in dying uh, legislation uh, is an ongoing controversy, and there are ongoing implementation issues across the country on this. It's unclear to me whether Bill C-7, as currently drafted, will resolve all of the issues that were uh, identified by the Quebec courts in the crucial decision and all of the other potential issues that might be need to be resolved in uh, settling the medical assistance and dying legislation. Uh, okay. I, we, don't, we don't know for a fact, but would the legislation have been improved by a uh, more fulsome debate in the House of Commons? I think that's the question for us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Terrier. Uh, Mr. Blakey, for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Brody, in your opening testimony, you made reference to the fact that this is a kind of first of its kind study here in Parliament in terms of the government being required to give some reasons for its prorogation. That was something that the Liberals brought in in the last Parliament because uh, they were uh, ostensibly anyway concerned to prevent the political abuse of prorogation. And yet here we are. I think for a lot of us, it's pretty clear that the prerogative for prorogation was was abused and was used to get the government out of a political crisis, which I don't think is the legitimate use of that. And here we are discussing the reasons after the fact. But I'm just kind of wondering what, you know, what can come out of this exercise. And for me, it seems to me that something we haven't talked about yet is the legitimate role of the legislature. We're bringing the legislature into decisions about Prorogation. I recognize that traditionally it's, it, it is a prerogative of the Crown, but just because things have been a certain way doesn't mean they must always be a certain way. And it seems to me that if a government truly 
wanted to have politically uncontentious prorogations or resolve the political tensions around a prorogation in advance, that they would include the legislature in these kinds of decisions. So I wonder if you have any reflections for the for the committee on that interplay between executive power and the legislative branch and what kinds of reforms we might consider that go beyond asking the government to give a justification after the fact. We can all dispute whether that's an accurate justification or whether there were other uh, reasons that were the real reasons behind it. But what could we recommend or what should we be thinking about in terms of uh, concrete measures to prevent the political abuse of the prorogation power? Mr. Blakey, thank you for that. Uh, a question. Uh, in my uh, a book on the subject, I tried to uh, outline the many complicated aspects of the relationship between uh, cabinet, the prime minister's uh, prerogatives of leadership, the decisions of the cabinet, and parliament as a whole, of which decisions over prorogation of the recall of parliament are only one of many, a complicated web of relations between the two, if you want, aspects or Hello, uh, Excuse me, I'm sorry, Dr. Brady, or Dr. Brody, to interrupt you again. Um, the interpreters are indicating that the sound quality still isn't good. I, I think it was working well when you were holding it up closer to your mouth. So I apologize again. Go ahead. No, no, no sorry, that's good for the mic. Um, sorry, we've had a lot of uh, injuries, and I think people don't realize uh, with the interpreters, it's very difficult for them because it has to go through another line in order for them to listen. So uh, I've stopped the time, so don't worry, this is not cutting into your time. Um, but that is why <laughs> we're, we're so on top of that. Yeah. Uh, so you have about um, 15 more seconds to make Yes, thank you. Let me say that as part of the negotiations.